Hello here and welcome again to another edition of the Husker Online Show. Sean Callahan, Robin Washett, Steve Sippel. Uh, we're primarily a football-driven show, but I think we'll have to talk a lot more hoops today. Guys, we're 19 days away from Selection Sunday um, here as we tape on Tuesday. And I know some of our proud affiliates air our show later in the week, so um, we're taping on Tuesday here this week. But Nebraska, um, you know, Robin, they're squarely in the tournament. I mean, in mm-hmm. We've been working together a long time. This has never happened this early where you feel that's good. I mean, because even like the no sit Sunday year, that went all the way into the Big Ten tournament where you didn't know for sure. I mean, they got in as an 11 seed, almost had a play in Dayton. Like right now, they feel, I mean, today they're they're squarely in the tournament, it feels. Yeah, that 13-14 season after no sit Sunday, you had a pretty good idea. But even then, there was still some doubt. I remember talking with some of the the coaches on on Tim Miles' staff and like so what are you hearing what, what do you think like even going into their uh selection Sunday party that they did at PBA this year so yeah I agree barring a epic collapse where they lose out and get blown out and completely stumble to the finish line which I do not see happening whatsoever uh they're in and now it's a matter of seeding and like you said uh, since our website has been in existence, this has never happened to where it's <laughs> February and Nebraska is comfortably in the field. They are officially off the bubble in most of the projections. Now it's a matter of what type of seed they're going to get, not if they're going to get in or not. Yeah, we've had to kind of come up with some new content. I mean, for, for bracket, we've never had to do this before. We're, mm-hmm. I'm like, Rob, we got to like cover the bubble and the bracket stuff. And, you know, we've never had this where, we, where it was worthwhile doing. It's it a like, good problem to have. Usually it's been like NI, NIT bracket projection. Oh, yeah. Well, that was all last year was NIT doing which they NIT got bracket last year. year. How they didn't get in the NIT last year is ridiculous. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, a lot more fun to talk about NCAA tournament than oh my God. NIT. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, so the, like I said, um, Thursday, a game against Ohio State. That's one that if they win that one, they're basically in no matter what. Uh, and then if they lose that one, then you got to take care of business at home against Rutgers. I think they'll be okay. Now it's double by, and we'll talk more hoops later on the show. Yeah. But I mean, the story, and same for the women's team. I mean, they're both men's and women's could both have double by, which is God. an incredible, mm-hmm. that incredible is deal. If that, if yeah, that the happens. women are there now, the men still have some work to do and tiebreakers to work out. But, but lots going on here as we break through opening headlines. I, I do, um, uh, want to talk about the new signing day rules for football uh, that are being talked about. Nothing is official yet, um, but you know we're we're a site that makes our living on recruiting coverage um, over the years. And when I first started doing this job, February was the big signing day. You know, yeah. everything was built around February. It was kind of a national holiday. Then in Scott Frost's first year, that was the very first year of the December signing day in December of 2017. So two signing days. Um, and they added two. Right. Well, All right, yeah. now there's discussion about possibly three. Three signing days. Interesting. And you would have a summer one. There's pushback, though, by some coaches about a summer signing day. And, and I can understand it to an extent. What is it? Um, What's the pushback? Oh, I, I, I think you're just really – you're eliminating like a senior year. Um, you sure are. Um, like, so what happens if a guy gets hurt? What happens if a guy gets better? What happens if a guy gets worse? Yeah. Um, by waiting till de- December, you know you can iron out some of those things and not rush it. Um, oh yeah, Te- you know, Sean. When Texas went bad, when Texas was bad for a while, one of the popular theories was: remember, Texas would always lock down their recruiting classes super early, mm-hmm. and and a lot of people thought, yeah, they're locking them down early, and those kids are tailing off; they're not having great senior. You get years. fat and happy. And that 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 can ha- that can definitely happen, and it also okay. So what we're talking about is a situation where there would be a June or August signing date, right? And I don't June or August, yeah, and like, then December and then February, three of them. I kind of think <laughs> August makes more sense than June. I just think you're really rushing it in June at that point. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people want to go and have the July month to kind of sort through things, right? And, and figure it out right you don't want to just have to like sign mm-hmm. with a gun to your head essentially in june because mm-hmm. um, that's what's going to happen i don't think people quite realize if they put in a june signing day 80 percent, if not more of the signings are going to happen in june 
Yep. It's really, it really speeds up the process. It's amazing when you, when you just pull back on this conversation and think about it wasn't that long ago when there was just one signing day in February and it was like a national holiday. Mm -hmm. Now everyone early enrolls though. Right. So that changes the conversation because, yeah. but the, so the other one, Robin is December. Uh, they want to adjust that. And, and this makes sense to me. The college football playoff is going to be 12 teams, maybe growing to 14. They're going to basically play over the entire month of December now with practices and bowl games. And that's already happening with bowl games and practices. Uh, but then you have the transfer port element. And I don't think mm -hmm. any, anyone really realized how big that was going to be in December. So if you're a coach, you're trying to sign all your guys, manage your own roster for the transfer portal, add new players to your roster from the transfer portal. So they want to kick that December signing day up to the first Wednesday in December. Okay. Instead of the third. And then they're going to eliminate four. road travel. But the proposal is to eliminate coaches on the road in December. Mm -hmm. in December. I like it. I mean, just for all the reasons you listed above, December has become just chaos now, especially if your team's good. Right. I mean, imagine you're you, penalized. Yeah. If you're yeah, if you, yeah. If you have success during the season, it is at the consequence of preparing your future. And with that is not a sustainable thing. And coaches have been outwardly against it. Mm -hmm. And so this is something I think that needs to happen. I mean, get that thing done with so you can actually focus on the most important part of your entire season which is postseason play in home post season visits. play yeah. in home visits though that's the one thing i don't understand when those will happen if they'll happen anymore they might not i think it becomes in school visits yeah. become more important right in may so may and april and january you can do in school visits parents can take part of these visits okay and when we're talking with kids at the in-state tour you know, I, I talk to each group of players and their coaches and their team, and, and I say, like, you guys need to understand the rules. I mean, these are the things that are happening now. That Do they understand? I mean, probably not, because this is the very first year of these rules. Right. Like, a coach can come to your school and sit down with you and your family. It's like a job interview. It's. I mean, Sean, if you back up, I mean, you're an older guy. You back up and, and look at how things have changed. It's, it's amazing. We're talking about the elimination of in-home visits, which was just a – which was a thing for so long, big thing. Coaches going into a living room of a of a kid's home and trying to lure him to the school. That's going away. It crunches the day, though, because I do think well, – I mean, you can still meet with a prospect later in the evening at school. I mean, there's no time that you have to meet with a guy. Right. I mean, if the coach is like, hey, I'll be at your school at 6 p.m., they'll go meet you back at school. And Rule made a good point. I don't know if it was exactly about this, but ADs, whoever, asked the coaches – you got to know these kids when you recruit them. You, you know, you got to know what you're getting. But then you just cut down the timeline, cut down the timeline. How do you get to know them? You can't get mm -hmm. to know them like you used to. So it's very interesting. And it's the, it is fascinating to me that they're going to have three signing dates is what we're looking at. I, it's not for sure. Right. Um, I think the worst, at worst, we're going to see December moved up and still have February. That's, that's, that's going to happen. December 4th, December 3rd type mm -hmm. thing. The first Wednesday. Okay. The Wednesday before conference championship games. Yeah, that'd be in that area, yeah. And then there'll be no road travel. Right. Interesting. I, I You know what, though? I, I think what they should allow, and I don't know if they'll discuss this, is on, on your bye weeks, they should let you, like, maybe go to in-homes then if you wanted to. Like, I mean, you don't have that much time on a bye no, week. Yeah. You don't have a ton of time. You got the coaches. All this talk is what goes through my mind is how – how much they have to do the coaches that there's so much on their plate and the in i don't think the powers that be have done a good job to alleviate all the stress on these guys now not that and you don't hear complaints but you're hearing guys get out i mean they're just getting out of the business or, or they're going into the nfl because it's just it's kind of a little ridiculous it's the break little, the breaks are so far and few between i mean right february is a dead period but now the coaches are out doing nil fundraising right it doesn't seem like a big break, does it? The head coach gets a great break in May. Okay. You know, once the kids leave, because he can't go on the road in May. Right. But then usually they put him on like a speaking tour. Or yeah. More of that stuff. And then June camp season starts up, doing do you, that every weekend. Do you, see why, do you see why NFL would be alluring? Those guys, you, those guys, NFL coaches, get as much as eight weeks off. I mean, and there are, there are weeks where they don't have to do anything. Where one of the NFL assistants told me once, we could I could go to Mars and they wouldn't care. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't. So they get they do get time off in the NFL. Now, if you're a coach, that might look pretty alluring. Well, it is. 
It is looking now. I'll give Matt Rule a lot of credit in the dead period in July. He gives those guys like three full weeks. His assistants, yeah, where they they unplug and and you know Matt Rule goes off to his, you know he's got a home on the Jersey Shore. You don't do they unplug those shows? Or they have to make recruiting calls? Right? Yeah, you're still just like when we go on vacation. Right when I go on my vacation, you I don't still really unplug. unplug. <laughs> I, Who really unplugs anymore? My un- idea of unplugging on vacation now is like when everyone goes to bed, I go down to the lobby bar, mm-hmm. right. And then you with work, your laptop and you work with a whiskey. I mean, that's unplugging. <laughs> that's unplugging. Yeah. Sean, and, those coaches, they are making recruiting calls on their vacations. They have sure. to. Yeah, they have to. You never Check really your unplug. email. Yeah. Here's the deal, though. If you're a high major power five power level coach, like are you how many of them are capable of completely just disconnecting? I don't know. I mean, you got to be wired a certain yeah. way to achieve that level of coaching. Mm-hmm. So, like, I don't know if you can ever just be like, all right, phone on airplane mode for the week. I'm gonna yeah. go sit on the beach. Like they just can't do this. It's like it's like Sean. It's like you. Right. Well, not me. I mean, I went to the Caribbean once and I left my phone back. I didn't even take my phone. It was back when you yeah. had cricket. I was gonna say, was this before Twitter? No. When I first met Sipple, his phone didn't work out of Lincoln. Right. I no, it wasn't. It wasn't that it was like five years ago, hmm. six years ago. And it was all it was glorious. I didn't have a phone. I loved it. It was you get used to it pretty quickly. Can you imagine me unplugging your outlet? No. Take not I'm taking kidding. your phone. Boy, it's God, I don't want to think about it right now. It's a it's a glorious thought. Well, you guys can do all my work and I'll unplug. That's true. You guys want to do it all? No. Okay. Just checking. Yeah, been there. All right. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back, um, we're gonna talk more about uh halftime show of the basketball game. It was a dunk contest <laughs> and it was interesting because it was uh Jeremiah Charles stole the show. He had a big weekend. We're going to hit on that and more. You're listening here to the Husker Online Show. And we're back here on the Husker Online Show. Sean Callahan, Steve Sipple, Robin Washett. Uh, taking you through here the month of February as we have our eyes set on basketball. Uh, but before we get into further discussion here on a great basketball halftime show, Steve Sipple, who is this segment brought to you by? <laughs> Larson Motors, of course. Larson Motors. If you're looking for a new vehicle, Go for a new experience at Larson Motors in Nebraska City. Larson Motors is one of the Midwest's only dealerships with all the major brands in one location. Think about that for a second. Finding your new Chevrolet, GMC, Hummer, Ford, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, or Ram really has never been easier. Start your new experience today at LarsonMotorGroup.com. We're at Larson Motors in Nebraska City. Larson Motors, you know what we always say, real people, real deals. All right, let's get into the halftime show discussion at basketball. Because, yeah. Robin, and God bless you, I've been to all the home games too, but we've seen some pretty odd halftime shows this year. And finally, I mean, I feel like the last two weeks they've hit home. The Baby's Crawling mm-hmm. was a hit. Oh, yeah. I mean, was that a hit? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. I missed it. It was adorable. It was, was it? like a bunch of babies that were probably eight, nine months old. Mm-hmm. And then, what did they do with them? And they had a crawling competition. Yeah, like, so you had one parent with them on one end and then the other parent on the other end. And whoever could coerce their baby to crawl from one parent to the other won the race. Oh, And of get- course, it was full of hijinks and hilarity. Oh, okay. What was the prize? Do you remember? <laughs> and then this week. Pride. So this week was, was um, the dunk contest and the football team was involved. And they had five players with customized jerseys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Emma Johnson. Full uniforms. Jeremiah Charles, Thomas Fedoni, uh, Kai w- uh, Whalen. As Whale. Sipple would say, Way- w- Waleen. Waleen. I think it's Waleen. It's- Sipple's <laughs> default to every name is just throw a Dean on it, by the way. Is that it? No. True RSS finish. Oh, and, and Heinrich. And, and Heinrich Harbor. Yeah. So you had five guys, Matt Rule present. Um, but they just had a simple dunk contest. And it was great. I mean, it was like I, I taped the whole thing. We have it on our YouTube channel. It was seven minutes long, um, but it was probably the best halftime show, the most engaged one of the year. And Jeremiah Charles stole the show. Freak yeah, as expected. Oh, freak. No, no. And they've been t- talking about that. Like the hype train for that kid is fully uh, at St. Michael's chugging along on the rails right now. Yeah. Go, go back to Evan Cooper at St. My- My- Michael's. Um, the event Sean put on there. Like they said, this is a kid that could. St- like push for a starting job. What position this year? Defensive back. Corner. I know, but where? Corner. Corner. Yeah, it seems like the opposite corner spot of Tommy Hill is up, more up for grabs than we realize. Hardsaw. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hardsaw. I mean, Hardsaw can play safety too, though. Right. Yeah. And can. this staff will, especially with DBs, 
even offensive linemen, I mean, they're, 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 they'll move guys around. They, they don't want to, to say you're set at this position, so they'll move a guy. Especially when you play five DBs. I mean, they had like three safety sets. So, I mean, like there's a lot of mix and oh, match yeah. that can go back on. Yeah, so Charles was – I mean, I was astounded by what he was able to do. I mean, how, how tall would you say he is, 6'1"? If that, six maybe one. six foot, six one. Yeah, he's got serious athleticism. Serious. I mean, serious. The also, Fido, Thomas Fedoni dunked, and people were like, ooh, knee problems. I was nervous. What's he doing out there? And he took <laughs> off like a Jordan dunk. From the I, from the Big Ten logo just in front of the free throw line. Yeah. And it was, it was, I mean, it was impressive. Now, here's my theory on Fedoni. I think he's trying to show maybe NFL scouts. I'm fine. Look, look what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, no braces, by the way. Mm -hmm. See, that's what I mean. No braces. And by the way, he does look fine. And I, I think he's, and maybe he's trying to, maybe showing teammates, maybe showing fans, but I, I think he might have the NFL guys in mind. That's a big jump for a big dude like that. I, I mean, know. like, that's just the, how impressive that was of a physical feat for him to do that. It caught my attention. Oh, he's uh, he's super. Yeah, his whole dunk yeah, yeah. repertoire was impressive. Like you know, he's a good athlete, but when you see him do like at that size, when he goes in, he looks like a like a big time football player, and he's taken off from just inside the three or free throw line. That's yeah. it's pretty incredible. Yeah, but Charles still wasn't enough to beat Charles. No. The between the legs, the or behind three sixties that he was doing for a guy that on the roster is officially listed as six foot one sixty six. Foot. And I think he's more like one eighty one. Yeah, I think he's now. put on weight from that. But either way. Six foot on a good day. Hey, Emma Johnson's only like 5'11". Those guys are explosive. He tried to dunk over Rule, which was a choice. Suspect, but <laughs> I, I, God bless was, Rule for... I know. He's probably like, you better make this. And of course, he missed it. <laughs> God, I mean, <laughs> look, these look angles are incredible. They are. They really yeah, are. I mean, look at that. that the reach for Fredoni there. Yeah. Freak. Poor Harburg. I mean, he had some decent dunks, but like... He didn't have a lot of... Uh, Clearly, choreography. Clearly, yeah, <laughs> clearly the caboose on that one. Yeah. So yeah, it was just it was kind of interesting. I, it, now, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. You, you've been around almost as long as I have. Never seen this at halftime. A football, the no, Nebraska football team. No. And it's because I mean, there's risk involved there. Like, all you need is one freak thing to happen to spoil that entire event. And fortunately. Nebraska was able to get through it unscathed and it ended up being this awesome publicity. Like that went nationally viral. Like every major news outlet was tweeting about how Nebraska had a football oh, yeah. dunk contest. Yeah. So that's, that's rule. Man. Yeah. The branding and rule was down there. Yeah. Rule was there. He was in it. Yeah. <laughs> he was a prop. Well, at first when he went out there, I'm like, is rule going to like try to dunk? You're like, Wait, he went down by the rim, and I was like, God, I'm gonna be pretty impressed if Coach Rule, if Rule could dunk, Rule that would freak everybody out. Back, yeah, Tomahawk. Well, like he got out of the hoop. I'm like, are they just gonna give him a ball to dunk now? Like, then, then he was standing down there. But it, I mean, everybody was captivated by it. Like, it wasn't like anybody 100. got up. Like, oh, we've seen awesome. some real duds. I mean, the the dancing soups, superstars, superstars. Was that dud? And then the the painter from yeah. America's Got yeah. Talent. See, I miss these. I miss these because I'm working. Well, and they're like they haven't done any of the usual ones, like the amazing Sladek or whatever. The guy with the chairs where he like balances okay. way up high. They haven't done Red Panda yet. Oh, they read. They did Red Panda. When? What about this yeah. year? Did yeah. they? Did they? Yeah, I swear Red Panda has done a game this year. What about Quick Change for men? Yeah, wasn't Quick Change really good? Yeah, I think they're done. I don't done. know. Retired? Could be. They're getting up there. That's the thing about all those acts is Father Times. Probably Father taking its toll a little bit. I mean, Red Panda. I don't know about that. Son. I would like. I'm a huge I'm Red Panda fan. Sure so I would have remembered came to one. I I don't know. God, maybe I'm wrong. I can't break the tie here. We'll, we'll have to fact. But her, I'm guessing her price is not cheap. No, that's the thing. And honestly, like Nebraska has other things it needs to pay for right now. And so, like when you get in house talent like that, that's your <laughs> I best. Don't think they're that expensive? Get, they are. Are they superstars? Thousands like, of dollars. Yeah, I think superstars is fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, but what Red Panda is probably closer to ten. That falls out of Sean's. <laughs> that falls out of shunts. Hey, lost in the couch every day. <laughs> lost in the shuffle at PBA. They started selling 24 ounce cans of beer on yeah. Sunday. Yeah. Wow. I know you guys can't partake in that. No. No. That's... I did I did finally got to drink drink a beer at PBA during a game when I went to the women's. I went to the Iowa game. You did. I took you full went? advantage of it. Yes. Did you? Yep. Maybe was, for lost was it like an 11 a.m. Yeah. Game. <laughs> Some people were giving me like, <laughs> I got a Voodoo Ranger IPA at 11 o'clock in the morning. It was like an 11 a.m. game and you're drinking a beer on Sunday. Look, 
Look, don't judge look, me. don't judge me. There was a time no, in this not. town that you couldn't get beer on a Sunday till noon. <laughs> I remember at restaurants and stores. You had to get it uh, like if you wanted to like pregame for NFL Sunday, you had to go Saturday night. I'll be done. Even like old Chicago, these places were like you couldn't get a beer till noon. Is that right? On a Sunday. I wonder when that ended. Look how far we've come. Probably twenty know. years ago. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm yeah, not babe in the woods here. I didn't know. I that. do. I do want to um, go back to Charles though, real quick here. Jeremiah. He, he had a heck of a weekend. I mean, he took part. And it was, is that Big Ten meet in Geneva, Ohio? Yeah. Um, so the Big Absolutely. Ten indoor meet um, took place in Geneva, Ohio. Charles took fifth in the long jump, six in the triple jump. So he competed Friday and Saturday, got back, I'm assuming Saturday night or Sunday morning, and then went right over the PBA mm -hmm. and, and did that. So you won talk, the dunk contest. I mean, you talk about a weekend for that kid. And yeah, Jalen Lloyd too also had a good weekend in Geneva. They both basically went fifth, sixth. Like they kind of flip flopped, if I'm not mistaken. But no, it is. That's right. They went 24 feet and change, and about 50 feet in the triple. Yeah. Uh, Bryce Turner did not run. Malachi Coleman uh, still not running yet. Uh, but those two jumpers really had good weekends. There you go. So Jeremiah Charles, look for him maybe as a starting corner. Oh. Maybe to make some noise. I mean, remember, he only played football for like a year or two yeah. of high school. So Cooper said he has a chance. So okay. take take it for what it is. Okay. Bob Wager, that was his guy. He brought to Nebraska. Big time athlete. That's all I know. I don't right. know. You never know how that's going to translate. You got to, I mean, a dunk contest doesn't mean he can cover a Big Ten receiver. You know, that's different deals. We'll see. All right. When we come back, we'll continue the discussion. You're listening here to the Husker Line Show. And we're back here on the Husker Line Show. Sean Callahan, Steve Sipple, Robin Washed as uh, we're talking some in-state tour here because we, we've held both events. Uh, we've had roughly 200-plus players and, I don't know, 28 programs come through. And, you know, people, how do you identify the programs we bring? You know, what I try to do is I make sure any program that we know that has a potential Division One or FCS guy that's on our radar, that's how we kind of invite who we come. Um, you know, we can't invite every school. Like, we – it's really hard, and I know there's some – I get emails all the time from people at other schools, like, how come you're not doing this school or that school? And it's not like we can do every single team. Um, so we try to generally pick around 25 to 30 programs to come, but um, it gives you a good taste of the the talent coming in mm -hmm. and Omaha versus Lincoln or Omaha versus the state discussion. And, um, you know, we've seen it kind of play out on the field the last several years, but – I mean, the gap between Omaha and the rest of the state, not just Lincoln, um, in the Class A type level, it, it continues to widen. I mean, I, it's I, really interesting when you think about it. I mean, if you just look at Millard South versus Lincoln, <laughs> I mean, Millard South's got how many guys right now with power five getting power? They have four three, interest. three with power five, but Jet Tamala is probably gonna be it's a going four. Get, so yeah. they're gonna have four for sure. Yeah, in the in the city of Lincoln, Rob has one. The city of Lincoln. As one mm. Jackson Carpenter, and that's it. Yeah, that's it. Millard South four or five, City of Lincoln one. Just, I mean, that's amazing if you think about. One well, West Side's got uh, two mm -hmm. right now. Uh, Miller North has two. Platteview has one. See, it's all, it's it's heavily tilted. Wahoo has one. I mean, mm -hmm. so yeah, and B Bellevue West. I mean, the guy in the middle of that picture there, uh, Keith. Um, is going to be a, a guy. I mean, okay. he's already got an Iowa State offer. So, um, yeah, it, it's interesting just to kind of look. Um, and that's West Side. We didn't actually get Christian Jones, though. He he didn't make the in-state tour uh, this year. But here's Creighton Prep. Um, they had a young team a year ago, so they, they don't have anybody yet at that level. But it, it's going to be interesting to see how it all shakes out because I don't really today see a Lincoln team in the top five of the state. And we're not, hey, we're not dogging on Lincoln. No. It's, it's just not, reality discussion. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's just we're talking about. Look at Central, by the way. I mean, Central's Omaha got some leads. dudes. Central, S Central's got some dudes. I mean, <laughs> we didn't even talk about Central. Yeah, the guy in the middle there, Ike Ackerman, he's a guy. Uh, but yeah, Miller North has two guys with Husker offers, and then the third guy there, um, uh, Henry Rayberg, has FCS offers. They have three God, guys. Rob, you just think about Miller South, Sean. Think, think what they line up. I mean, they're going to line up with a quarterback, Jet Tamala, who's who's Lincoln Riley's coming to see in the spring. Nebraska, he's already thrown for Nebraska. He already threw for Glenn Thomas and Satterfield. Then they line up two Power Five level receiver or tight ends. 
both six foot six, both six foot six, and then Amari and Jackson, six foot one receiver, Millard South's all time leading receiver as a sophomore. With two years left, he's already the school's all time. He'll have receiver. a chance at C.J. Johnson's um, yeah. career record, career state record. Yeah, I think he needs to average like about nine hundred a season, or a little over nine hundred and something a year. Which, if they play in twelve or thirteen games, which Pretty good chance they're going to play 12 or 13 games a year. He'll get that record. Think about what they line up. I mean, that's amazing. So, Sean, you've talked about this before, about the level of transfers in the high school ranks. Like, How much does that play into teams like Miller South stockpiling so much more talent than almost an entire city than, than what's in Lincoln right Yeah, now? the dynamics of Lincoln versus Omaha for football are different. Uh, Omaha's got multiple school districts. You know, there's districts like Bennington, Gretna, and Elkhorn you can't go to. Like you have yeah. to live there, you have to pay the property taxes because they're really expensive taxes. So they can't, you can't transfer in those districts. But okay. West Side, which when we were growing up in the '80s and '90s, that was the, that was an exclusive district where you had to live there. West Side now allows transfer options in. Millard, if there's room, will take transfers in. Okay, um, you know, OPS um, as long as the school is not full, will take transfers in. So it, it's just allowed kind of a Pandora's box um, where talent can move around and. I mean, it's not out of the question for a kid that lives in Elkhorn to attend Bellevue West. Right. You know, happens. and that's a 35 minute drive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not out of the question for guys to go all around the city um, to go to high school every day. Where in, in Lincoln, you see it to an extent, but it's just a different framework. I mean, LPS has a different model of how they operate their athletics than what you see in the, in the Omaha <laughs> district. I mean, West Side's a great sure. example. Like, They've just continued to build and build facilities and, and you know, Dr. Lucas there, their superintendent and Tom Kirkman. I mean, they're, they're building a, a sports juggernaut over there with all their athletics and resources where LPS has a model where if one school doesn't get something or if, if every school can't get it, no one can get it. So okay. like Lincoln Southeast should have its own stadium, but they can't because not every LPS school could have their own stadium. Okay. Um, and that's the model of LPS. There's some serious knowledge being disseminated right now by yeah. Sean. That was like amazing. you can't um, fundraise. Throw the ball out there. Let like, get it. <laughs> if you were a booster and said, "Hey, I want to okay. get Lincoln Southeast football hundred thousand okay. dollars," you couldn't just do that. Couldn't do it. You got what? It's so got to go through the district and red taped and distributed. Um, it, it's just a little little bit trickier, I think, with the way Lincoln. And I, I feel like that's hurt the overall growth compared to what you see in Omaha where it's allowed some programs in Omaha to really advance mm -hmm. and move forward. I mean, they're going to Phoenix, Arizona. For Miller a, South. Yeah. Creighton yeah. Prep's going to go to St. Louis. Okay. Miller North's going to go to Denver. I'll be darned. To play football games this year. Yeah, that's Crazy. a big deal for those kids, by the way. And we had our surveys. That was a question in the anonymous surveys. Okay. If you could go out of state to play a game, where would you go? And a lot of the coaches were like, not even a thought, because it wouldn't be allowed in our school district. Mm. Interesting. So, yeah, the, the in state tour is amazing. I mean, it's a great service for those kids. It gives them exposure. You hear that a lot from the coaches and there's people who who start to hear about it. It was really valuable for me, Sean, because I got to talk to the three Nebraska 2025 commits Caden Vermas, T Tyson Terry, and, um, and Connor Booth. I, I, I really enjoyed it. It's interesting. Connor Booth's an interesting kid. Uh, big running back, six foot two and a half, six foot one and a half, two fifteen. Got to play baseball. Getting recruited by Oral Roberts for baseball. Getting recruited by Wichita State for baseball. And he's gonna he's gonna do the baseball thing, which I'm always skeptical of, by the way. But um, they he's he's gonna try it. He's gonna be a running back at Nebraska. And he's gonna try to play baseball. I was talking to Amon Green, by the way. He wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. He Amon, remember Amon Green by chance? Um, Amon Green heard of him. <laughs> wanted to play. He wanted to. He was a great baseball player, central center fielder, hit four hundred. Um, Tom and Frank were like. Mm -hmm. Damon Benning was a good baseball player. Yes, too. he was. And that's why he went to Northwest. Yes, he was a great. Of Bill baseball. Olson. Yeah. Eric Strickland played for the Marlins. Yep. Yeah. Eric Strickland could have played football, baseball, and basketball in Nebraska. And he tried football. He did play football a little bit. Mm -hmm. he, he did it. Like mean, he. And then he played for the Marlins uh, minor league in, in one or two summers, didn't he? Yeah. Like their development. Absolutely. Yeah, he was a minor league player for the Marlins. Who was it? Kyrie Cooper. Kyrie receiver? Cooper. Yeah. Remember he that played. Was, he baseball. did. That was the first time where you heard I heard a coach just publicly say this ain't working out. No, remember it was I Ted Gilmore. Ted Gilmore. 
like during one of those group interviews we do, somebody asked him about Cooper. He said, I don't know. He's not over here. He's with baseball. I don't know how he's doing. Mm -hmm. it, it was clear he wasn't happy. It's with. like he was okay at both, but not great at one. Like by doing two, it just didn't work very well. No, it's hard. It's hard to do. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying Connor Booth can't do it, but Connor Booth himself said, though, you know, the only way the coaches are, are going to allow is if I'm playing baseball. Like if he's riding the pine for Will Bolt, mm -hmm. just it'd be wasting Waste your time. time. Yeah. Ty Kildow was one that played both. Ended up switching to be a baseball player, but Ty Kildow. It, I mean, he was faster than fast. He ran four three, <laughs> and <laughs> he never got thrown out. Like really? on one of those early, it was an Erstad team, I think. But he yeah, yeah, get, it he, was. I mean, if he got on first base, he was stealing second and third, like every time. And did he play? Did he end up playing football? Yeah, he did. I mean, he tore his knees out. I mean, but he was as fast of a football player as I've seen come through here. I mean. He, <laughs> Anyway, the in-state tour worked out well. Jackson Carpenter was there on sa Sunday. He's we, we referenced him. He's the only player in Lincoln with Power 5 offers, Power 5 attention. It's really down to Nebraska and Kansas now. Like K-State and Iowa and Northwestern have been involved, but they're I think those are uh, – It's like, down to them. It's down to Kansas and Nebraska. It's interesting. It's really interesting to watch this. I don't know who will win out there. I think it's really close. His dad, of course, is Tim Carpenter, who has three national title rings at Nebraska. Um, but he says he insists his dad's not just just stays out of it. And we know Tim. That's how Tim is. Yeah. He's not gonna meddle. Yeah. So he's a receiver. We'll see where this goes. What do you say, Sean? When's he gonna make his decision? Spring or early season? Yeah, spring. I mean, I, he's a lot of these guys too are gonna graduate early. I mean, like it had to be surreal this week for a guy like Jackson Carpenter. He he just played his last basketball game of his life, probably. You know, they lost to Miller North in the district finals. Yeah. And that's it. You know, and Brendan Frager was on that team, and and he's a junior, played his last basketball game. Now Frager's going to come in early, like in the summer. Yeah, he'll be here in June. Now Carpenter wouldn't. Carpenter would go through December, but just not do basketball. Mm -hmm. Yep, Frager will be here in June. I assume the plan is to redshirt, and give him a year in the program, work on his skills, get the strength and conditioning up. Be ready to go in 25, 24. 25, yeah, that was 26. a disappointing end of their season to see him get blown out by him. I mean, they have he was playing his best basketball of the season down the stretch, dropping like multiple 30 point games. He broke the school record with 39 points. So he he got his groove towards the end. So unfortunately, he couldn't take it further in the post. State his name one more time Braden Frager. Yeah. Their team, though, had so many good athletes. It just didn't gel. It didn't click for whatever yeah. reason. It happens. So never, never quite clicked. With the number, I mean, yeah, Jackson on the bench. I mean, Jackson only they only played him like eight minutes a game or something. He wasn't like, mm. and you know, I, I think of the great like Lincoln Southeast teams, their football players. You just played them. You're like, hey, my coach is that way. He's like, I don't care if you don't play basketball all year. Like, I want these athletes on the court. You mm -hmm. know, Barrett Rude, go out there and play center. I don't care if you can't do all the <laughs> summer league stuff and play football. Yeah, you're an athlete. We're gonna play you. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't see that as much because there's so much more specialization. That's it. These guys you said the key word, Sean. But if That's I'm a coach, I'm playing. Like I, I don't know why a guy like Jackson Carpenter with a 37 inch vertical and he can play defense. I know the Nebraska coaches when they watched him play. They uh, so the Nebraska coaches went to Jackson Carpenter's game and Jackson goes through warmups pretty light usually. Mm -hmm. He knew the coach wasn't going to play him a ton, so he put on a dunk display in warm -ups. Jackson did. Yeah, just went off and warm about that? Just to show the coaches what he could do, and the Carpenters were like, why is Jackson? They realized that he was showing the Nebraska coaches what he could do. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, Sean, you have kind of an old-school take there on on playing guys, but I agree with you, but is this so – Sean, world changed. Yeah, you, re you reward specialization more than right. sometimes true, and especially in those big schools. It's, mm -hmm. it's hard. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of kids, so – um, all right, when we come back, we're going to take questions in the mailbag. You're listening here to the Husker Online Show. And we're back here on the Husker Online Show. Sean Callahan, Steve Sipple, Robin Washett. Uh, time for the mailbag. Abby, um, before we get to the first question, it's beach volleyball season. And we actually got to see like a true beach volleyball game in Lincoln, Nebraska in February, meaning they played outdoor on the sand. Yeah, it was beautiful yesterday and they finally went outside. I don't even know like when the last time that they played a match outside has been. And actually this like season before the season started, they like practiced outside a couple times because it was nice. So yeah, it's pretty wild. But Nebraska's five and oh now. Oh. Um working right now on Tuesday for their sixth win. And then they head off to LSU where 
beach volleyball is very big deal there. And then they go to Hawaii, California. God. So uh, much nicer weather there. Yeah, it's do people Maybe. come? I mean, what what's the crowd like? I mean, we know what Husker volleyball crowds are like normally. What's the beach crowd like? So they're not actually open to the public because they play. So where the beach volleyball court is actually like connected to like the Olympic sports weight room. So there's like not even a curtain there. Like balls will like fly over and hit like track guys that are just pumping weights back there. So it's it's a very different uh, vibe. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but they actually have like a really nice sand court. I think the sand's like a foot and a half, which is what the U.S. volleyball team practices on. And it's pretty much the hardest court that they'll play on all year. So that really helps set them up. Is there a coach there? Like, is John there? Um, Cook. John is not normally there. No, he's not the coach. It's Jalen Reyes and Kelly Hunter that are the coaches for that. And beach volleyball is kind of different because the coaches can't say – anything while they're playing like they switch sides every seven points so then they will like say things then but like they can't even yell that like a ball's out or anything okay. and Interesting. the rules are very strict and it's great for the girls to like <laughs> develop all of their skills because you have to do everything and it's really hard to move around in that sand can you imagine if they would have been able to promote open to the public outdoor beach match like they'd probably get a couple thousand people out there oh, yesterday. Yeah. yeah no question yeah, and it was so nice out. People just want to go outside. What time? Like, what time would would they have? What time are these matches? Um, it depends. The one today started at ten. Ten a.m. Yesterday they were at nine and two. This is a world I'm just not familiar. with. <laughs> like Wayne State as a beach team. Yeah, yeah, they played them yesterday, and I think their top team actually beat Nebraska. Well, ben, well, so. uh, ben Bramer uh, was Ben Bramer's sister on their top team. Yeah, I think it's Matt Maggie. Something so like the that. tight end Ben Bramer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, Wayne yeah, State upset good. Nebraska. Nobody knew it. Well, if a stop the presses, if a, if well, a tree falls in the woods and you, uh, what's Nebraska was still one four of the sets, but all right, let's yeah. get to the mailbag. How about that? <laughs> That's what we're here for. Okay, we've actually talked about this a lot already, and I had this question, so you just set me up perfectly. But who is the best multi-sport athlete in Nebraska history, or mm. right now? Um, that Nebraska? Tom Tom Crop, without a doubt. Is the all time best? I mean, John, I, just going old school on us. Oh, it's not even a discussion, is it? I don't think so. I mean, he Tom Crop played for the Washington Bullets, and he could have played in the NFL. He was drafted yeah. by the Steelers, and I believe he could have been a pro baseball player. Good God, drafted by the Steel. Okay, drafted by the Steelers, and did play for the Bullets in the a NBA. long career. Yeah, he was an NBA player, and he was a Larry Bird type story where he came to Nebraska and had a kind of a rough experience, and he transferred back to go to Kearney. Okay. Tom Crop. No kind of like Larry Bird going to Indiana, going to Indiana State. Like that was in that era. Um, that was one of the early, you know, a, a misfire just of that era that they weren't able to make that work. Tom Crop would be regarded as one of the all time greats here if he was here. There's a lot of Strickland third. would be in that conversation. Eric Strickland. I mean, kind of just reeled off all his accomplishments. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's no doubt he'd be. He and Crop are the ones that come to mind mm -hmm. for me. Strickland was. I, I mean, he's the best defender I've seen at Nebraska. He's an incredible defender, but he, he had, could have had, played pro baseball. Had some offensive game. Could have played pro baseball. He practiced with the football team. Never got in. He never played in mm -hmm. a game, but he was good enough that they were interested in him. So yes, I'd say Strickland, Crop. Those are the guys. Sean, Tom Crop. There's a lot of thirty somethings that heard that name for the first time just now. Yeah, Dirk Chatley wrote a great article about him. And you know his career and Tom Crop, like even up in his older age, every day at lunch he would play full court one on one basketball with another like coach or teacher, and they would play each other one on one full court. Cool, cool. And they, they were like physical matches. I'll bet they were. I mean, they weren't just like layup drills. I mean, it was a I mean, he he's old school. There you go, Abby. Okay, next one. How long before we see some kind of NIL setup for high school football? In what schools do you think will be able to have the best collectives or organizations? Cool. Yeah, it's dicey because NIL, you cannot, the rule in the NSAA is to maintain your eligibility. You cannot um, wear your school logos or promote your school. Um, so you, you could theoretically have a collective and have athletes do promotional work, but they could not wear their logos or promote their school. And there have been, you know, Maverick Noonan, Malachi Coleman, Daniel Kalen. I mean, these guys have received NIL and made NIL payments in high school. Like it, it's not unknown 
but I, I think you'd be really grasping at straws to think that we're going to see like a full fledged like NIL system at the uh, high school level. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, of the depths. I mean, I think going to Phoenix is an attractive sales pitch to a team. Like if you're a kid, like hey, come to Millard South, we're going to play a top five team in Phoenix and fly out there. I mean, mm -hmm. stuff like that to me probably is, you know, somebody's got to pay for that. Yeah, I don't. I mean, it's a tough one. I, I don't. I don't know though if we're just going to ever see it where you're going to see like a high school have a collective. Well, there's a full blown Matt Davison collective for right. Lincoln Southeast. Now, some people would say like, like West Side is like. I mean, because West Side has a lot of resources and backing, but they're not. No one's doing it to like that level. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not talk about that. We're not there yet. We really are selling trouble here. With <laughs> you know what my sense is is that people don't even like that discussion. It's that, private. You're talking yeah. about people's personal finances. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're, it's not like it's not it's no one's business, really. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next one. Will this Nebraska men's basketball team be considered one of the best in school history? Oh, no doubt. Well, if they win a tournament game, yes. <laughs> I mean, inherently, yes. Yeah. Very preliminarily, Rob. I'm thinking about a Sunday column. If they would Nebraska beat Ohio State, I think you'd say this is the best Nebraska team in 30 years. 93-94. Better yeah. than the Lou team, right? Yes, better than the Lou team because here's why. They had Lou and Vince, and their su supporting cast wasn't great. Um, if Lou would have had a bad game, they would have been in trouble. In this, On this team, if Casey has a bad game, and you could have another guy have a bad yeah, game. They've got like six or seven right. guys that could all step up. Right. Now you would say, no, wait a second. They don't have a they don't have a second round, first round pick on this team or a second round pick. They don't. Mm -hmm. But I just think as a, a unit, they're better than they're definitely better than the Lou Venson teams. Mm -hmm. so they've got guys that are in conversations for potentially all Big Ten defensive team for six man of the year mm -hmm. for potential all conference honors. Mm -hmm. And so that in itself shows the depth that you have multiple players in conference postseason accolade conversations mm -hmm. that shows the depth that they have and then the fact that the, the teams that they're beating so like 17 18 is like the most recent comparison just because of the number of wins they stockpiled they didn't play anybody they had one quad one win and they okay. lost their other one yeah that's a crazy deal no no now playing. rob you're you're and so that starting five was really good it was really i, I would put so that you're starting talking five who? over this starting five who, who are you talking about copeland glenn watson isaac copeland james palmer isaiah roby yeah now, some people are going to say this team's not better than that one. Again, the depth. depth. Is, hey, depth. go go six through nine. Right, depth. Not even and they defend. Close. They defend better. I'd say. Oh yeah, they're, this is one of the best defensive teams we've seen, certainly under Fred and going back even past probably the probably the Sadler eras. Mm -hmm. So I think I do think you, you now. If I don't know, it shouldn't depend on whether they beat Ohio State or not. I thought about writing it yesterday. Then if they lose to Ohio State, you look like a moron. But if they beat Ohio State, I think that you start thinking about that this team. Well, I already think of it that way. I well, just think it'd yeah. be more appropriate. Well, the if the they Ohio, Ohio State, State win changes the conversation from they're in a great spot to they're in, without yeah. any question, in my opinion. If they beat Ohio State, that's another quad yeah. one road victory. Check, check. You're in. Now you're playing for seeding. It would be hard. Here's the thing about they would have to play themselves out right now, as you said the other day. And losing to Ohio State doesn't change much. No, and the, here's the thing about Nebraska. They're playing so well right now. They're not going to play their way out. And they're a low-maintenance team. Like, there's not a lot of, like... It's a bunch of older guys. There's not a lot of, like, guys that demand attention on this team. A bunch of veterans. No, they're, that's a great way to put it. That's a great way to put it. They don't... They're, they're a team, and they're older guys, and they share the ball. And they accept their roles. Yeah. Oh yeah, Fred's and they got thrive it. in those roles. Yeah, Fred's got it. They're dangerous. All they're right, dangerous. Final question, Abby Barmore. So it's state basketball tournament time. What is your favorite state basketball memory? Wow. Well, I've got a few because it's hard to just have, do one. Oh, just do one. <laughs> sure, yeah, we could come quick. back around at least because um, you're going to steal my answer. I know you are. I don't know about that. Unless you were Robin, you can go first. What's your favorite? Okay. <laughs> well, just go ahead. Well, the recent one the winnebago run okay mm, david winget um and, and just how many people that's a good one were here like the class c1 semifinals are on friday morning at pba and pba was full at like nine in the morning mm -hmm. and 11 30 for two c1 semifinal games and a lot of it was because of winnebago i mean just to see like the draw that they had with the community they're I mean, fun to watch that 
and they were fun to watch. They played so well. They passed so well. Just, just the way it captivated that community and captivated the state tournament crowd. I mean, that was up there. That game against Grand Island Central Catholic, mm-hmm. where Johanna Guyfon was playing. I was at that game. Um, what year? Ah, God, two thousand. Uh, 17, 18, something like that. Johanna Guyfon was a Craig Bull. It was earlier than that. Was a Craig Bull football recruit. Um, big guy, NFL level guy. Had some things go wrong. Never made the pros, but you know, he was squaring off against Winnebago. It went back and forth, back and forth. And I mean, it was packed. I mean, to get in the arena, the PBA for a high school game. I mean, that was that's that's up there definitely for me as a recent memory. I mean, growing up, my first state tournament I ever went to, I went to go watch Omaha Gross, my alma mater. I was in seventh grade, and that was my first time ever going. And for me, that's a memory because we, we I got to see Wahoo play Gross in the semis. And that was the peak of that Wahoo era. Um, and Gross was good. They were in the Metro Conference back then. They beat a lot of Metro teams. They beat a lot of Class A teams that year as a Class B school. They got smoked by Wahoo. I mean, Wahoo was at a different level of basketball in the 90s. 2015 was the Winnebago okay. state title run, just for clarity. Did sake. I steal yours? You did not, thankfully. Uh, my, and I don't know if I would, it's favorite, but also just more unforgettable was the 2020 state tournament. That was the last sporting event, live sporting event before COVID shut down the sports world. So that was, it was right on the heels of the Fred Hoiberg episode at the big 10 tournament. And like they were debating, are we going to let fans in? And it ended up just being this weird thing. And because I had press access, I was Mm. apparently clear to go. So I went to that and some of the best games like buzzer beaters, that was the, Bellevue West Millard North game with Hunter Salas and uh, Jason Green, Chucky Hepburn. Like those, those, it was one of the best Class A state title games that I've I can remember. Fiddler, and there was like the, the, nobody could come and see it, mm-hmm. and they had garbage bags all over the seats. It was weird. It was a, it was just such a, a unforgettable experience, just because of the dynamics of what was happening to the world, but then also the level of basketball that was happening. In the gym, I, I credit the NSAA for keeping. They the let it happen. On. They were close, and I mean, they they had they everybody on them to cancel that thing. And, yes, and they did. Dr. Beller was like, "We're going to go through with this. They're just going to get through with." It. I mean, in what a time! Seriously. All right, Sip. I want to hear. You. I don't have any great ones. I now here's the thing. I remember I start covering Nebraska football in '95. Okay, so I pretty much shut down. I didn't cover high schools. Didn't go to the state tournament usually. '95 on. So mine all predate that. Now, I do remember pretty well like going to see Hoppin when he was an Omaha Benson bunny at state. I was a kid. Not I, Dan, Dave. Dave Hoppin. <laughs> as a as a he was played at Omaha Benson and he played in a state tournament. It was it was super cool. A seven footer. Okay, I remember Rich King at Burke going as a kid. I was, was a, I was a kid, probably not really a kid, but those are those are the things. And I also vaguely remember as a as a little kid. You guys won't know this, but it was like the Bob Devaney Center had just opened, and they and they had state basketball there. It was like the first time they had state basketball there, and I was just a little kid, so it was wild to me. It was it was amazing. This new arena, paid for by cigarette tax largely, and being in there, and I remember sitting up in those plank seats. That's all I can really remember. I don't even remember who was playing, but yeah, I don't have Did any. Columbus make state when you were there. Yeah, I was. I think I was there watching Columbus. No, right. not when I. No, when I played, we did not. See, we made. We played in the. Who's per- we? Omaha Gross. Gross. Yeah, we yeah. played in the Pershing Center oh, when I was. Did. A senior. <laughs> you did. And, and we were the evening session in the yeah. Pershing Center. So that. Um, you played in the Pershing Center yeah. at State. We played Seward, and it was a tie game in the last minute. We ended up losing, um, like by four or something. But couldn't get it done. Probably one of Seward's <laughs> best teams they ever had. I mean, they had a really good team, and we, you know, it was a. Tight Nick year. The best teams our senior year didn't win it. I mean, Beatrice was probably the most talented team. Pius was the best, one of the better teams. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't win down there. It was, I think, Shattern beat Skyler in the finals. Okay, my senior year. You played Pershing. Interesting. Pershing, no longer, no longer there. It's a library now, right? I don't know that Not yet, but I don't think so. I don't rest think so. in peace. The <laughs> real original Red Fest, by the way. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. they did have it there. They kind of yeah, got rid of that. Was real. That was the real rib fest. You're right. See, Sean. Abby, do you have a state tournament memory? Um, I don't have like a specific one. That's okay. But my um, 
my cousins and my family is from Why Not, and they are they play Class D two. Their girls basketball team has won, I want to say eight state championships since two thousand eleven, and there was a time when they had won like seven in eight years, and I would always go as a kid, even when it was in Pershing, we went several times. Um, and then my my cousins actually played a couple years ago. They won back to back. I'm pretty sure. So I just I always love going watching them and it's kind of a family thing. Like my grandparents will come this weekend and my aunt and my cousins. So do you have why not awesome. gear? I do. Ooh. Hey guys, you <laughs> I do. You'd be, you'd be interested in this. I did cover a state tournament game one time in the morning session at Lincoln East. I was looking for the working for the Lincoln Journal Star. The t- deadline was really tight because it was the Journal Star afternoon paper. I had the wrong team winning. It was stripped. <laughs> I had the wrong team winning. It was stripped across the top of the paper with the wrong team winning. They were and and the next day I had to go back and the the crowd was like chanting journals. I, it was it was it was like it was like living in a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was gonna get fired for sure. They didn't fire me. That's a state tournament memory right there. That's a memory. <laughs> I had the wrong team winning. <laughs> Stripped across the top. Of you the, weren't even in Bay when the woods there. You no, know, I just messed it up on deadline. It was a real bad deadline because again, at, people don't understand. What do you mean? Who won? It was an afternoon paper. I remember those days. Yeah, it was an afternoon paper. So the deadline was like eleven thirty or noon. I was firing it out, and I called them and said I got the wrong team win, and they said it's too late. It's too late. Oh, it's all. It's yo. Yeah, oh, it was horrifying. It was horrifying. Well, if I would have known that, I don't know if we would have hired yeah. you. <laughs> John, come on. We're going to go watch Carter Nelson next week, I think. We are. Right Carter next Nelson. Door, 1045 yeah, on Thursday. We're going to go over there yeah. next week. So, All right, when you come back, we'll talk Husker basketball. You're listening here to the Husker Online Show. And we're back here on the Husker Online Show, final segment of the program. And a uh, reminder, if you're not a member of HuskerOnline.com, check us out. Lots of great stuff going on with basketball coverage, in-state tour. Uh, we're on the – uh, cusp of spring football coverage as well. Um, we got a great deal. Two months for one dollar. Simply use promo code N U one um, to take advantage of a great special and a great deal we have at huskarline.com. That's promo code N U one to try us out um, here as we wrap through. But I want to close the show, Robin, uh, with some basketball discussion. We've already kind of talked some hoops, but um, man, we saw Pinnacle Bank Arena. At its peak, a 70-some degree Sunday last week, Minnesota. Ooh, it was the, good. The rail yard is hopping. By the way, they've Chamber already – Chamber of Commerce type day. They, they right took there. out the ice. I mean, I think they just saw what the forecast was going to be, and they removed the ice about a week ago. Mm-hmm. So Skating rink? Yeah, it's yeah. gone. And, they, I mean, it was it was peak like football season type crowd. Now, I was a little disappointed that there was only like one outdoor beer window open. Mm. They weren't prepared for it's very disappointing. <laughs> well, imagine like 5,000 people in one window. That's what we had going. You could go in a venue and, and walk outside of it. But um, I would imagine, Robin, we're going to get another day like that Sunday. Yeah. Early forecast suggests a very similar setup for that 5:30 senior day night tip against Rutgers. It was intense against Minnesota. The crowd was intense. Well, and even here, and so for one, the students were lined up, and it was back past our office at the post office here, like two hours before tip off. So the students were geared up, and then like it was kind of slow trickling in. But then like once you got in, like that fifteen minute window of tip off, the bar crowd started rolling in, and just the energy you could feel it. Like people were ready; they mm-hmm. were tuned up, it was ready to go. <laughs> it wasn't it's so intense for like the Penn State game wasn't as intense. Yeah. The Minnesota game was really, really intense. It's people can taste it, right? It's close. So many people want tickets now too. Like, you know, we've had our season tickets since PBA opened, and it's funny how many people come out of the woodworks. Hey, do you know anyone with tickets? Mm -hmm. You know, and everyone obviously wants lower bowl Mm -hmm. um, to get gotten by that, but it's hard. It's a hard ticket, and it's going to be probably over a hundred dollars get in price for lower bowl seats for this game. Oh yeah, the KSA finale in PBA. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, think about that. It will yeah. challenge. I mean, the arena record is still no set Sunday, which is like fifteen thousand nine nine seven or something around that. Yeah, they'll never list it above 16. sixteen, so we'll never truly know. But it could be up there. Rutgers is just gonna get pounded. Oh, I know. <laughs> I mean, so that it was already like a heavy advantage for Nebraska. Yeah. Like it's too much. Early Ken team. Palm odds have it as an eighty percent chance Nebraska wins that game. Listen, it's a lot. I, I I said that kind of facetiously, but 
I watched some Minnesota possessions when the crowd was revved up, and I thought it did rattle them a little mm-hmm. bit. They made some plays that you're like, what are you, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. And I think the crowd can get two teams. The Nebraska crowd is super loud. I mean, Nebraska, it's packed. It's, it's jam-packed. Like, it, who was the former Michigan coach? I'm going to butcher his name. John Beeline. Yeah, he he made reference to it. Beeline acted like it's a like a recent phenomenon and said – the recruiting is going to change at Nebraska. Well, the place has been packed and they've been good. Pretty at much it. been packed every year since PBA right. opened. Yeah. Right. But it is like if you're just coming on to it, you guys got to think of the guy in Albuquerque, New Mexico, watching the game like, God, look at this. Look at Nebraska. Look at this place. It's John Beeline's best Michigan team got blitzed in PBA. So he should know about that. Back but, at but, 17. But if you're looking from the outside and you see a game in Lincoln, you'd be like, whoa. That is nuts. Mm -hmm. I turn on a lot of college basketball games, and it's not like it is in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the second year or third year of the alcohol sales. For sure, second. I think it's second. Second, yeah. So, I mean. How much does that affect it? Oh, it it factors. Like, I mean. It it turns a sleepy, like, after, like, early afternoon tip into, like, a party. Okay. And, like, people aren't, like, getting crazy with it, but it just gives you that extra juice Oomph. it's hilarious like a mixed drink there though like a you can get a double yeah take, take a guess what a double mixed drink costs at pba i've never got one for the record bucks it's 18 bucks is it really and oh man eight that's a lot. when i'm in line i'll, I'll get one beer pregame maybe one i'll have two maybe 20 spot and, oh. and I'll, there'll be guys that order a mixed drink and the, they'll they'll say do you want a single or double and i always hear everyone the guys say double double i mean cash cow nice nice doubles yeah. So yeah, Robin, they're rolling. They're rolling. I mean, they they look really good right now. Just don't overthink it. That's why I tell people don't just watch them. Yeah. And you see it just in the way that they're carrying themselves now. Even like take that Minnesota game compared to where this team was in early January. I mean, just the level of confidence and swagger that yeah. they have. Like they they Quiet, go though. into games, especially at home, uh, expecting to win. Like and and win big. Mm -hmm. Whereas before it was like, all right, one game at a time, we got to get through this one. Like you're starting to see this team kind of take on the belief that we're good and we're good just beyond like contend in the Big Ten. We're we're a postseason team. And when you have that just between the years, all of a sudden your whole level of play across the board and and everyone is bought into what they're doing. The biggest thing that stood out to me as the this team has evolved is the evolution of role acceptance and mm-hmm. how guys are completely buying into their respective ways that they can impact games and help their team win like josiah alec is a perfect example oh, yeah. sam hoiber jamarcus perfect lawrence. example jamarcus lawrence cj wilcher mm-hmm. all these guys that yeah. could have their own individual interests but they've found ways that they can make nebraska good and they have excelled mm-hmm. in those individual areas to where collectively this is as good as they've played in a long long time yeah they fit well together you got to give the coaching staff credit for finding guys that they built it. Yeah. It's not just so often at Nebraska, even before Fred, it looked to me like sometimes they just throw guys out there and hope that they would fit. This look, they, it looks like they put this together with a plan Mm -hmm. and Bryce Williams is gigantic. You bring in a guy like Bryce Williams, who's so even keeled, but so reliable. I mean, you know he's going to be there every game. And he doesn't Mass. always play well. Nobody ever, nobody always plays well. Rink oh, Mass. Rink is huge, he's just gigantic. Just his consistency, yeah. Like, and even he doesn't—he doesn't have always great games, but you know he's always going to be there. Mm-hmm. You know, and they got guys like him where even if they're not putting up numbers, they're still impacting the game. That's what I mean. Like yeah. his facilitating out of the high post, even if he's not scoring a bunch, mm-hmm. which he hasn't the last few games. I mean, he's creating opportunities for others. Same thing with Casey when he's having a bad game. He draws so much attention that everybody else benefits. And so this is what separates this team compared to previous years where you have – how many guys we've already listed about, like, impact players for Nebraska? We're, like, we're like seven Six, or eight deep right seven. now. Six, and seven. That's not even counting Eli Rice, who's been hurt and mm-hmm. was one of the more promising young guys that we've seen come in as a true freshman. So, so Boogie Coleman, did he just kind of get benched too? That was yeah. another guy that played early in the year. Yeah. Somebody in my seats asked me about that. He's there. He's still practicing. And um, just, just for, got the, the rotation got kind of squeezed to eight. Yeah. Sam Hoiberg's evolution changed things. And then oh, moving well. Bryce to the point changed things. By the way, Sam Hoiberg, two more years left, right? Yeah. Good God. I mean, Good. Two more years left of he's Sam. A, he's a redshirt sophomore. Yeah, he's, he hey, he's fun. Yeah, he's like, fun and he's he's valuable. That's Kit's favorite Extreme player. Culture. Car- guy Carly's a Tomonaga fan, and Kit's a 
Sam Hoiberg. Sam's man. got serious defensive ability. I mean, I think some guys they see him and they think, okay, I'm going to take him. Mm -hmm. Nope, Good he's luck. explosive. Yeah. Like, yeah, he's explosive. I mean, he looks like he could play football now. He's built. Yeah. yeah, there. But Rob, you're right. It's a lot of the. Oh, here's what I'd say. There's six, seven, eight guys reliable, deep. They the shooters is the key. There's seven or eight. They're My shooters own, above six. And Lawrence is really come on as a as an mm -hmm. offensive player. Him coming off the bench was the best That's thing it. that could have happened to him. Sometimes yeah. you just need to see the game from a different perspective, and God, to being able offensive. to come off the bench, watch how the other team is, what their game plan is, how the game is being officiated, and just kind of the the flow and pace of the game. To be able to jump into that with that understanding, as opposed to figuring it out on the fly, mm -hmm. I think has done wonders for him. Mm -hmm. And credit him. He's an, again another one of those guys that says, you know what, I can help this team more coming off the bench. So, a guy that started 23 straight games chooses, elects to come off the bench. That is a culture. Right? And Bryce Williams taking That's that culture. Bryce Williams taking that point guard role is a culture. All right. Well, three games left Thursday night, Ohio State, Sunday night. Uh, Rutgers and Lincoln, and they'll they'll close at an 11 a.m. game on Sunday at Michigan. Um, so just three games left in the regular season. Uh, double bye in sight, NCAA tournament in sight. Nobody's going to cover this team better than Robin Washett, so I urge you to follow his work, his coverage. His, uh, he is the lead writer on Nebraska basketball, and, and he's got the years of experience. He's seen a lot of a lot of basketball. Right now? I'm not going to say bad basketball. I'm going to say a lot of basketball to get to this point. So, Robin, uh, I'm happy Quite a for bit you. Of it has been bad. <laughs> you you get to experience this run. You, oh, it's beautiful. Thank, thank you. You, you know, know. I, I I mean, Kent Pavelka. We've we've put in our dues. It's about yes, time. All right. Well, uh, once again, check us out huskerline.com. Um, full coverage throughout the weekend of Husker basketball, baseball, softball, and much more.